Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. We are joined by former Division I head coach Jamie and Christian. Jamie was assistant coach at Emory and Henry, Bucknell, William and Mary, where we actually met, and then VCU under Shanka Smart before becoming the head coach at Mount St. Mary's and then Siena, and then he ended up at George Washington, where he coached until 2022. Uh, in this episode, we talk about great things, such as what it's like going from assistant to a head coach, what his recruiting philosophy was, how you hire assistants when you become a head coach. Uh, we talk about players, guards, what it takes to be um, a D1 guard, the transfer portal, and much, much more. So enjoy, I enjoyed this episode, talking to my good friend, and hope you enjoy it too. So without further ado, here's the podcast with Jamie and Christian. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. Maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Jamie, and welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here, man. Long time no see, and uh, always love supporting you. So it's great to be a part of it. Yeah, I appreciate uh, appreciate that, and appreciate you coming on was doing the math yesterday and we met in 2009 back in Lexington. Actually, we didn't even meet. We talked in 2009 about a player I was coaching uh, at my previous, one of my previous schools, Lexington Christian Academy in Lexington, Kentucky. And this player was Taylor Barnett. And at yeah. the time I didn't know Jack about college recruiting. So I called probably everyone in America about him. And you actually picked up the phone. You talked to me about him. And then you made an eight hour drive to come yeah. see Taylor. Now, even that, Post that when I went to Gonzaga and other places talking to college coaches, I've never had someone do that. And we have been friends since that day. And since that day too, whenever I've got a kid that I think might fit your level, you're my first call because of <laughs> you taking the time to pick up the phone and take a chance on just some assistant at a small school in Kentucky. So first of all, thank you for that. And second of all, for everyone wondering, Taylor Barnett did end up, did end up going to the University of Virginia, starting his yeah. first game as a freshman, then transferred to Belmont and became a March Madness hero for them. So you did actually make a good trip. He didn't end up going to where you were at, but still. Great player. He's, he scored 40 points that day. He went. He had 42 points that day and like seven or eight threes. Uh, it's one of the most one, one of the most impressive in-game performances I've seen from a high school player. Well worth the trip. Yeah, he might have been a sophomore at that time too, I think. so. <laughs> yeah, he was young. He was good though. But anyway, like talking to coaches now and even back then, like what – where did you get the – was it the head coach you worked for where you asked him, like, hey, I want to drive eight hours each way to see this kid? <laughs> or or well, because that doesn't really happen much anymore. Like, t tell me, like, what that philosophy was that either you had or your head coach had at William well, & Mary. It should happen. Um, I think some of the reasons why we have so many mistakes in recruiting right now is because guys don't jump in the car and make a judgment for themselves. They're allowing people to uh, tell them who's good and who can play for them. And, and, you know, I listen to those people. I think those people are good people to listen to, but I want to get two eyes on each player. Um, Coach Shaver at William & Mary was amazing because he gave us so much freedom to kind of fly around and do whatever we needed to do, especially in recruiting. But I would actually say it actually starts, you know, I was an assistant coach at Emory and Henry College in southwestern Virginia for a guy named Bob Johnson. And the great thing about Emory is we're five hours from Richmond, three hours, three and a half hours from Charlotte. I think we're six hours from Nashville, two hours from Knoxville. Um, and from Emory, it's about, I think I want to say four or five hours to Lexington. Um, and so you're in this weird quarter where like within five hours, five or six hours, you've got a lot of good basketball. So when I was an assistant there, we would practice at 530 in the morning and I would leave right after practice, drive to any one of those locations and drive right back. Um, I would cover a lot of ground in a day, stop at a lot of different high schools, see a lot of good players. Um, so I've always felt like you know, for me, that was like a great trip. I made a bunch of phone calls. I saw a bunch of players on the way out. Um, and obviously, you know, Barnett was so, so special. It made it, made it special at the end of it, but that's just my philosophy. And that's where we've had success when I've been a head coach. We've had assistants that are willing to jump in a car and go see a good player. Um, you know, you, I would say this, you know, your, your call was important though. And sometimes people under, under appreciate the, the importance of the initial call I could tell you really believed in him. And I could tell you, 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 at the time you didn't know a ton about college recruiting and, but you're like, look, he's getting six, seven threes in a game and he's about six foot three. And, you know, you kind of gave him the parameters um, of who he was as a player. And that, that, that convinced me enough to jump in the car and just see how good a player he was. And, and uh, you were right. Um, and a lot of people at the time did not have the same vision that you had for him. So big credit to you. 
Well, thank you for that. But you know, you being a former assistant and and head coach, like you're getting inundated every day with AU coaches, high school assistants, kids, yeah. parents, foreigners, JUCO, yeah. and just even back then trying to sift through that all, Jamie. And I, and I'm talking back in 2009, not even today's yeah. day and age. Like that still was a lot to go through. And yeah. it, it, it's great in, that you worked for a coach that that allowed yeah. you to do that. And I believe in following up. So anytime someone would email me, even as a head coach. Um, and I would, I would really hope our assistants did this as well. We would follow up, um, Mm -hmm. every email, like, you know, my first job, one of my first jobs was in cold calling. Um, I was doing like annual fund sales for, for Mount St. Mary's when I got to the Mount. And I just feel like the cold call is such a great way to gain information and cold calls in our business come from, from coaches, high school coaches, assistant coaches, AU coaches, and emails and text messages, and just the ability to follow up on all those, you know, you know how many times when I was cold calling, I'd come across a card that said, Hey, busy this week, please call back next week. Um, and I would look and be the end of the week and no one had called that person yet. So I would just follow up and call. Um, you know, I ended up being one of the highest, uh, my fundraisers in that grouping over the, over the four years that I did it. And a lot of it was just looking at the card, following up. And so I feel like the follow-up is really important. People appreciate when you follow up, they appreciate when you have information um, from the conversation before um, you're trying to build a relationship with someone in a, in a short amount of time. So the follow-up is really important. Yeah. And just so you know, like from those days in Lexington, Kentucky, there's a few coaches that got back to me like yourself and, and you're in that small group that, you know, we're going to, we're going to follow each other's careers. I'm going to help you. Because it's just, you took a chance and, you know, that's why everyone that reaches out to me too, I want to get back to them. Just, you never know what's going to happen. And, and that leads to my next question. Um, over the course of your coaching career, did you ever get an email from a player uh, that turned out to be a really good player that, that you just kind of got dropped in your lap? You know, so I'm sure we have with the emails. Uh, Bobby, uh, Bobby Plunas, who ended up playing for us at Mount St. Mary's was an email sent from a guy who was I was really close with as a, as a friend. He sent me an email about a, about, a, about one of his players, and I follow up on it and watched. Uh, I would say probably the coolest one was a kid named um, Robert Hudson, who played for me at Emory and & Henry. And we used to send out these cards. These They're they basically like uh, postcards. Mm-hmm. And it would have on there, we'd send them to every high school within that six-hour radius. And it would have like, who are your top players, top seniors, GPA, height, weight, size, all the stuff there that you would just be able to have. And we'd actually include, we would send the post, the, the, the stamp so you could send it back. So we just wanted to make it super simple and get it back. And I remember one day and I'd come in every morning and, you know, I'd get in about, I'd do some stuff from eight to nine, then at nine o'clock to 10, I'd always check the mail and I would go through those cards. And so as soon as I got those cards, I'd follow up. So I come across this kid named Robert Hudson and I read it and it says this guy is is um squatting, I think it was like 455 pounds at the time. He's five foot ten. And and I just look at it, I go, man, like you could tell with the way that his head coach had written the detail that he had written on the note and the card that he really believed in this player. Um it, it was, I mean, he made sure he put all the information in and 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 at the time Robert actually was a was a was an orphan. So he wasn't, you know, he 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 lived in like an orphanage with a, with a host family and all that stuff. Um, and so it ended up being this amazing story about follow-up. And I, I remember looking at the card and being like, I have to call on this kid. And I called on him and he was outstanding. I think they almost, they almost won the state title in Tennessee that year. Um, and he was just an outstanding. He's probably a division two, low division one player, to be honest with you. We got him at Emory and Henry. Um, and I remember going out there and, and meeting him for the first time and kind of going to the orphanage and kind of walking around and meeting the people that kind of live there and, and just learning about his life. Um, and so, I, again, I think these these small things are where you follow up. Um, and he ended up being a thousand point scorer. He's one of the best guards in the history of Emory and Henry College. They had a huge turnaround um, the his junior year where I believe they won two top 10 teams in Division three. They beat Randolph Macon and Virginia Wesleyan. And um so I have that story and I have, you know, other stories where follow up on emails, but, you know, le- I learned early on in my career that most people aren't going to call, aren't going to take, go through the mail every day and call on those mm-hmm. cards. Um, and I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to have, I'm going to be different and I'm going to call on every one of these. And if a guy's not a good player or he sends his film and it's not good enough, we you know, we just kind of move on from it. Um, but the reward of it, if he is a good player is more than worth it. Yeah, absolutely. And you might be the only one reaching out to him as well. And He's got no yeah, choice but to go to you. We we got him over late, late. I think like Middle Tennessee started messing around with him late after 
he was playing, I mean, he was playing so well. I mean, you're talking averaging like 19 points a game. One of these guys that is five foot 10, but gets up above the rim, makes deep threes. I mean, he was like an electric player and I couldn't believe how good he was. Uh, when I got out there and watched, I was like, I can't believe how good this kid is. And middle Tennessee kind of started messing around with him late. Um, they ended up taking someone else and, and we got him and we we're in a great position for it. And, you know, his situation was so different because he was really looking for people to really rally behind him. He had never really had like a, a full family environment all the time. So getting to know him really earlier in that process, um, I knew he was going to be a loyal kid because he wanted stability and uh, he got it with Emory and Henry and, and uh, you know, he's doing great things now. Oh, it's a great story. Now you went from Emory and Henry to William and Mary to be an assistant to then go to VCU under shock of smart, but you were a D1 assistant for four years before you got the Mount St. Mary's head coaching job. And that to me, yeah. Jamie, it seems like a very fast transition. Yeah. What do you attribute that to? Well, first of all, you can, bra you can brag on yourself a little here too. So, no, you know, I, I, it's weird. I never thought I would, you know, there's a couple things. Number one, when I was 25 years old, I was uh, operations at Bucknell in between Emory and William and Mary. Okay. Um, and I, and I get, I, I was, I thought I was going to be Emory and Henry's next head coach replaced by Johnson. I was 25 years old. And I, I can't, I was going to go back to Emory to be the head coach. And at the last second, my, my, my AD and, and mentor said, he, he calls me and he goes, uh, and I, I was like, I, I wasn't heartbroken because I trusted him, but he, on Friday night, you offered me the job. I'm taking the job on Sunday. He calls me and says, Hey, you know what? I had a second thought and um, I had a second thought. And I think if you come here, you're going to get stuck here. Um, and, and, and shoot, four years later, I was a head coach at, at Mount St. Mary's. Um, so he was spot on. I remember getting that phone call and being in such a calmness at 25 saying, this person knows what's right for me. Mm. It's like this, the phone call was, he believed in me. It wasn't that he was calling me telling me I wasn't good enough. So no, you, you can do this job. There's better things ahead for you. And, you know, four years later, I'm at, I'm at Emory and Henry. And I had honestly never thought about, you know, it's weird because I've been kind of fast tracking my career, Corey. And, but I've never once really thought about being on a fast track. I've always just wanted to be at a place that loved basketball, where basketball was important, where I could play a big role in that community. And that's what I've always been looking for. Um, and so not, a, not an assistant very long. I was a head coach before I was 30 years old, which I learned later on. That's like a metric. To, you know, so it's, oh, you're a head coach for your 30. Everybody wants that. Yeah. And honestly, I had no idea that everybody wants that. You know, I just wanted to be in a place where people loved basketball. And it happened to be my alma mater at Mount St. Mary's. Two years before, I didn't interview for that for the head job there, and came up short. Didn't get it, you know. They thought someone else was going to be better. So, you know, the guy before that was there forty nine years. Milan Brown was there eight years. So I said, well, this one's probably past me. I'm probably not going to have opportunity at this one. And then two years later, you know, they basically called me and said, it's your job if you want it. And uh, you know, the rest is sort of history. But walk me through this. If yeah, is it your recruiting? Is it your X and O's? Is it that you got? You're easy to get along with and yeah, you could see you being yeah. the head of a program. Like, what do you think that was? I, I love, I love the game. First of all, uh, I love it. You, you, you talk to a lot of coaches, you know, like most of these guys don't love the game. They love the polo that they get to wear. They love being at the events, being able to poke their chest out. Um, I, I love the game. I, I love basketball. I love basketball as a tool that changed my life, a tool that can change other people's lives. And I just enjoy being a part of that process. I think when I communicate about the game, I think that comes off. Uh, I think it comes off that I genuinely love the game. Um, I, I love to, you know, I like to be good at things. You know, I get obsessive with certain things. Um, and basketball is one of those things. You know, we're recruiting a guy. Like, I want to get him over everybody else. I want to I want to evaluate a guy that, that no one thinks is good enough and I know is good enough, and then he turns out to be an All-American. Um, and I've, I've been fortunate enough to do that a few times. You know, Jalen Pickett, we coached him at Siena. He's All-American, one of the best point guards in the country at Penn State this past year. He had one offer coming coming out of high school, and it was us at Siena. You know, we competed with nobody for him. At the end of that freshman year, he's one of the best point guards in the country. Um, I think he was a freshman All-American, right? Just one of these most unbelievable players in the history of Penn State basketball, Siena basketball. And then with my history, we just have a lot of guys like that. I mean, I like Marcus Thornton, who was a 40 – was a, was, a, was a top 50 pick in the NBA draft who people in the D.C. area didn't think was good enough. And I'd come up and watch this kid play as a sophomore and junior, and I thought, this guy's amazing. You're watching how he's moving and how he's able to get his shot off. And, and I was amazed that people just didn't, didn't, couldn't see what I was seeing. You know, and then he ended up being, you know, being drafted from William and & Mary and being one of the best players in William & Mary history. Um, but, you know, when I look back at my history and I kind of look back, I've, I had a, I've had a lot, I have a lot of stories like that of 
guys who I feel like were like me that were under the radar that maybe were underappreciated in some area that when you get in the right environment with the right people who really believe in you, special things are going to happen. I do think when I walk in a room, um, because I believe like deeply in the human spirit, I believe that when you're in the right, again, when you're in the right place with the right people, special things happen. I think when I walk in a room to do these interviews, I think people go, man, this guy can inspire me. Therefore, I think he can inspire other people. And that's what I've always been striving to do. I want to go back to you saying you were the only offer for that point guard at Siena. Yeah. When you talk to a lot of college coaches, they always ask, well, who else is offered this kid or who's looking at him? And I've seen you shaking your head here for those that can't see the video. But tell me your philosophy. If you see a kid like a Marcus Thornton, like your point guard at Siena, and no one else is on him, does that make you pause a little bit? Or do you know with your own eyes, like, I know what I'm seeing here? Tell I me your philosophy on eyes. that. Okay. I trust my eyes over everything else. Uh, I think that question is the dumbest question question to ask <laughs> honestly um every time people start you know or even when i call and they say oh yeah well, he's been offered by this this and this and you know uh, great uh, that, it, it means nothing to me i want to watch him play and i want to see what he like one thing that i like guys guys that have great charisma you know mm. i remember going and watching this kid named junior robinson who was a darling of march madness in in 2017 five foot five point guard can dunk it shoots deep threes and I remember going and watching him play in his gym in a, in in uh, in a, outside of Atlanta, and I was there to see somebody else. I was there to see a six foot four, you know, borderline high major kid that that really liked us at Mount St. Mary's, and I watched Junior just kick this guy's ass for four quarters, and I watched Junior come down and he's elevating everybody on the on the floor. He's elevating people, you know, it, like he's playing the game, and people are watching going, oh wow, oh wow, like look at this. You see what he just did. He's controlling the tempo, controlling the game, and controlling the atmosphere and the environment. I look for that. You know, like, like, and I'm not saying he was over celebrating. He wasn't over celebrating. He was controlling the energy in the room mm -hmm. because of his play. And to recognize that in a player, and I'm watching, I'm watching the game and I'm thinking, well, this other team has four division, has four high major players, and his under the radar team is kicking their ass. And every team that he's been on, finds a way to be in the top four, you know, no matter what. He was on a team that had, I think he had three Division One football players. Mm. He didn't have any basketball guys on the team. So when you talk about trusting your eyes, that's just what I believe in is, you know, know what you're looking for. You know, when I talk to coaches, and I do some coaching consulting now, when I talk to coaches, I'm like, well, what do you want in this position? And they're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, tell me what you want in a point guard. What characteristics do you think are most important? Do that for every single position you have, because then if you know what you need and what works for you, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. And, and so I always kind of start there and I've always tried to hire a staff that could really embody that. Um, I just got so many stories in my history that of guys that were, you know, I mean, we're, we're next year, next year I have a chance to have potentially four guys that are going to be in that NBA draft conversation. Mm. Um, James Bishop, who was a highly sought after player, people said couldn't play point guard, and we played him at point guard. He played it great. Joe Bamisil, who people thought, well, he couldn't defend enough. He's going to have a great year at VCU and really be on the market again um, for the NBA because the way he can score it. Jameer Nelson Jr., um, who coming out of high school, people didn't think he was a Division one player. He's now one of the highest. He was the high one of the highest rated transfers in all of college basketball. And I remember watching him play and the burst and the way he can control the game and thinking. Why wouldn't someone want this on their team? And then Jameson Battle, who had one Division One offer before he chose GW, and I got a chance to kind of inherit his recruitment and keep him at GW, and and he he led the Big Ten in scoring two years ago. Um, so there's all these stories around us that say trust your eyes, believe right. in yourself, do the work. Um, and so I've just always tried to do that. I love it. That that five five guard, where'd he end up going? He played for us at Mount St. Mary's, and he's still okay. playing overseas. He still he ended up in the Hawks summer league. And what was amazing was he ends up in the Hawks Summer League. And I told him, I said, listen, they're they're not gonna let you guard Trey Young in 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 the in the camp in the summertime. They're not gonna let you do that. So first possession, I think he tries to pick up Trey Young full floor. I was like, listen, they're they're not gonna let you do that. He did it two times. I blew the whistle, said, You gotta meet him at half court, right? Because he's just a guy that can get up underneath you. But I also to told him, I said, listen, you're probably not gonna play in the summer league until the last couple games. Mm -hmm. The Hawks were really young. They had Trey at the time who was coming in as a rookie. They're bringing a lot of different guys. Uh, J, uh, you know, a lot of different guys are bringing in. It's like, so you just need to get yourself mentally prepared to be ready to play at the end of the summer. And he goes out the end of the summer, plays unbelievable the last three games of the, of the summer, helps him get him overseas contract. 
And I just think like this understanding of who you are and where it fits into the entire the entirety of the game really matters. Um, and again, there's a ton of, you know, just a ton of relationships I have with guys, you know, and they've been able to fit in well. Awesome. Now, when you went from your four years, the D one assistant and then director of ops as well at Bucknell yeah. to the head coaching spot at Mount St. Mary's, Jamie, what was the biggest change you saw that you weren't aware of? Well, you know me, I'm a pretty highly confident person. So, you know, and my confidence sort of comes from, um, knowing that I'm going to do the work to learn whatever I need to learn. Um, you know, like my confidence isn't built off, you know, being the best player in the country, X number of years, the best coach in the country. It's really, really built off of just knowing that I can do the work and that I can learn most things if I put the time to it. Um, and so I would say the, the thing that I had to learn the most was just how much time you have to spend with your staff in terms of how you want them to operate. Mm. Um, you know, there's sometimes you have some staff members that are really, really individually motivated and know exactly what you need. Um, but there's a lot of guys that need just a little bit of direction. And I've been, I've had great staff members like Corey, I've got five guys right now that are head coaches, um, at different places, a couple of NIA, a couple of NIA, a couple of division two, a couple of Juco and one division one guys that work directly for me. Um, and I'm 41 years old as of yesterday. So I'm really proud that I feel like we've always had these staffs of guys who, who we work together and we learned how to operate together and they've been able to take some things that they learned, learned what that we did together and, and take them on to other places and be really successful. But I think that that's really important is, you know, when I'm talking to head coaches now, new head coaches, and again, I do this consulting stuff. They always ask them, what's your plan for your, for your assistant coaches. And they're like, well, what do you mean? Like, I'm going to give them their responsibilities. I'm like, no, like you should give each person that you work with a plan for how they're going to be the very best. Um, just like you would do your players. And then you should follow up on how to help them be their best because if your staff's really sharp and you're really sharp, you're going to be really, you're going to be operating at the highest level. It gives you the chance. I always say, can we operate it at, at our highest capacity? And the high, you can't get to your highest capacity unless everybody's at the top of their game and everybody's working within their purpose within, within that vision that you share. Yeah. Perfect. Now let's talk about recruiting strategies here. Cause this one, I, I, I love talking to coaches about this and, you know, right now, currently, you know, I think the number one thing coaches look at is a transfer portal. Yeah. Then JUCO, then international, then prep school, and then fifth in line is high schoolers. Obviously, when you got sent Mount St. Mary's, we didn't have the portal like it is now. But when you stepped into that job, and then we'll go to Sienna and George Washington. Yeah. But first, when you step in there, like you only got so much bandwidth, right? Yeah. So, what was your philosophy recruiting wise? What, which of those five were you trying to get at Mount St. Mary's and why? Yeah. We, you know, we always, I love high school kids. I love the, I love this progression that I have with young players going from young to old, going from a freshman who's just wide, wide eyed, wants to do anything to a seasoned senior that you can have conversation with and talk about um, how you want to build your program. Um, you know, actually at Mount St. Mary's, we didn't have, and then we, and I would say this, we always would supplement. I do believe in this supplement with your roster from the portal, which you can't find in high school. That was my biggest thing. So, you know, like DC area, for example, if you're six foot six and can move at all, you're going to be division one plus. Like you might be higher. Like I always feel like DC area, mid-major players will go high major, low major players go mid-major. And they always kind of go a little bit higher. So a lot of times if the guy was a little bit bigger, it was just hard for us to get a bigger player from the area. So we would go to Texas, Florida, Carolina. We would start stretching out a little bit for bigger players just because it was hard to get them in our area. But if we could take a guard from the area, we're taking a guard every single time. So really understanding your job. Like one of the first things I do, Corey, when I come into a place, um, and this has really helped me every place I've been to build out a strong recruiting strategy. So if someone's listening, I, I would encourage them to do this. Go back and look at at all the Hall of Famers and all the thousand point scorers and where they're from. Mm. Um, that gives you a blueprint that that's historical of where your best players are coming from. And then take the time to figure out, like, you know, maybe there's a small blip of, oh, there's a bunch of guys from West Virginia. Well, why was that? Well, maybe there was an assistant from West Virginia. Or, you know, really figure all that stuff out. Because that gives you a blueprint. You know, we got to, when we got to GW, they had only had, I think at the time, they'd only had four guys make it from freshman year to senior year to, to be, like, good players and graduate. Like, everybody was, like, transferring out or transferring in. So even before I got there and before the portal, there was all this movement that was happening there for the very best players. Um, and what you're talking about in, in the A-10, you need four top 22 players in the league to be your very best. In the MAC, you need three top 17 players. And in the NEC, you need three top 15 players. So knowing exactly what you need to be the best in your league is super important. Um, and I think people sort of, you know, what you need in your league and what you, and what you can get. 
and trying to figure that out. There's some places where international recruiting is huge. So at GW, because you're nation's capital and because we knew guys were going to transfer out, like Jameer Nelson transferred out, Jameson Battle, we knew that was going to happen because the history of GW of really good young players says they're going to transfer out and they're going to go high major and they're going to have good careers. But it also says there's guys like Tyler Cavanaugh, James Bishop, guys that might go a little bit high the first time that we can bring back in that will now be all A-10 players. So really having this full understanding of like your situation, um, I think really matters. So we've kind of done it both ways. Mount St. Mary's high school supplement with, with transfer guys at Siena. We actually brought in only brought in one transfer guy that year. We we're going to do it mostly high school guys because Siena has such a rich tradition and upstate New York basketball. We felt like we could keep the guys there and then have such a rabid fan base that love basketball that we thought that'd be a great option. And then we brought in guys like Elijah Burns, who was, you know, it was at Notre Dame, who was from Albany. He came back and was and led the nation in field goal percentage as a senior. And and Carmen has continued to do that, supplementing the roster with guys coming back home from high major roster. So I kind of give you that whole thing. I think when you look at it that way, it's not just about um, high school, prep school. It's about, you know, the history of the place tells you a lot about what you can do and what you can't. So to, to piggyback on top of that, when you get assistance, right, how much are you looking at X and O's versus – their recruiting background. Like, are you trying to get a Texas guy? Are you trying to get a DC guy? Does an X and do you need just a guy that focuses on X and O's versus recruiting? Like, talk to me about picking assistants because that's they're gonna be your your, you know, your bird dogs out there finding these guys. Yeah. And, and there's so many different shapes and sizes. And like, would you want, I mean, just so tell me your philosophy first. When you first yeah. wanted to get your assistants at Mount St. Mary's, what was your thinking and what kind of guys did you get? Mount St. Mary's, we weren't paying a lot. Um, so I wanted to get assistants who had great versatility. You know, typically if you're at a job where it, the pay is at a lower level, you know, you might not have operations, you might not have video, you know, you're going to be deficient in some areas. And so you need guys that can do a lot of things. Um, you know, you might need guys that can do the video and do some of the op stuff. You And I just think knowing your situation and not coming into it saying, hey, this is what how it has to be. You know, we won a lot of games in Mount St. Mary's without GAs, without uh, ops people and you know, without a strength coach, we, we, we won a championship one year without a strength coach. Mm. I just did it myself, you know, like, um, which I don't think you should do. That's a big risk. Um, but I'm, <laughs> my point is like, you know, when some of these other opportunities, you're getting this job because they don't have certain things. So having the ability to figure that out. So in Mount St. Mary's, we said, we really want to go with agile guys. Um, we took a lot of guys who were video coordinators and, and operations people at other places that were just hungry to get on the road and get some experience. I didn't worry as much at Mount St. Mary's about, um, guys in the area because I've been recruiting the DC area for so long. So I knew sure. the area, I knew the people. Um, now that didn't mean those AU guys were very happy with me every time we had a job open and I didn't hire one of their guys, but I just felt like, you know, we, we were going to sort of get the players we were going to get. And I didn't know if having one of, one of the guys was going to make a big difference, right? Like the reality of it is if, if I'm going to hire someone to be on my staff to recruit an area or, or certain players, my expectation is to get players that we shouldn't get. You know, my expectation is not to get the guys that we should get. It's to get the guys that we shouldn't get. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm in the A-10, I want to get a guy who's low Big East, low ACC. If if I'm in the in the MAC, it's to get a guy who's maybe low CA. Like, I think that's a fair that's a fair that's a fair expectation if we're going to hire for that. Um, and I'm disappointed if I hire for that and don't get it. So I, I you know, so I really try to stay away from that as much as possible. Um, you know, I do have a system the way I like things to operate. Um, so, I, so I try to make sure that I hire people that can follow direction and that can contribute in the right way and can kind of share and that are excited to share and excited to learn. So I really start there. And then when you kind of get in these areas, you know, like we were at Albany, we hired Carm, who was a city rocks guy, he worked, played for city rocks. That made a lot of sense. When we got to DC, you know, I wanted to make sure we took, we, we, cause DC a little bit different with the, so we did hire somebody there to kind of handle some of that stuff. So, you know, I think every situation is a little bit different. Um, you know, and both those situations, all those situations really worked out. We got good players in and, you know, for the most part, people were happy. But I think I think the, the question is how much will you care about the perception if you don't do that? Because these positions are really hard to find. And every one of the every one of the AU guys you've ever worked with is going to call your phone and try to get a guy in there. And you're going to have to say no to somebody. And it's who are you willing to say no to, but be able to maintain a great relationship with. That's really the most important thing. All right, let me ask you this. If you were hiring assistants and you needed to get uh, three assistants and you were picking assistants from major metropolis areas in the U.S. and you know you're going to get players from those areas, what three 
metro areas would you want to focus on for your style just based on stereotypical how they play yeah. like we know how dc players are obviously we know kentucky yeah. players tell me your thoughts over your years of doing Great this question um you definitely want of, a dc guy right or are you going to cover that yourself me, some of it some of it for me is regional um you know you know an area that i think is under under there are two areas i think are really underrated minnesota uh, in general, I know that's not a, that's a, that's a state, Minneapolis, mm -hmm. um, but Minnesota I think has great basketball, great basketball. Uh, I just love the players that come out of there. I would always want to keep someone that that can recruit that area, that would know that area, because you can get some under the radar guys that no one's that no one recognizes how good they are, and they mm -hmm. just love basketball in that state. And you know, at some point, Minnesota go for basketball is going to be great again because it's just they've got a lot of good players. They'll figure out a way to keep them at home. I feel like right now Texas is a really underrated Dallas, Houston, those areas are really under underappreciated right now. Um the covid year where the, where the where the red states were able to kind of work out and maintain a little bit more, they're really far ahead in basketball. Um so I kind of give you those areas. I don't know if I really answered the question there. Always a DC guy because I think you know DC's to me is like the um this is going to sound, people aren't going to like this. To me, it's like the center of the of, of the basketball universe at the youth level. Um, everyone kind of passes through there. So whether it's um, international people are passing through there, whether it's the tournaments that they have there, whether it's, you know, you know, you think about this, like there's, at one point I count, I could, I could be off now, but at one point there was like seven shoe team deals in the D.C. area. And the state of California had three. You know, seven teams in, 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 the, in the DMV. From buoy him to take over to buoy him to take over to you know you just kind of go through it Baltimore and so there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, money put into DMV basketball so it makes sense to have someone there that knows a landscape not just for the DMV you know but you know like a guy like Keith Stevens like he's connected to people all around the country mm -hmm. you know I mean he's connected to teams in Canada and teams in, on the West Coast so you know a lot of things kind of go through that DMV area so it's good to to just be able to have foot traction there. Yeah, I just want to give a plug to Kentucky too. Not saying they're necessarily the best college players. So a lot of those kids I like go Kentucky. off. Look, uh, Corey, I'm going to tell you this, man. I, I like Kentucky basketball. Like, there's a reason why West, Western Kentucky, um, Eastern Kentucky, uh, in Northern Kentucky. There's a reason why they're good. Uh, you know, so I, so I, I, I don't mean to cut you off there. Like, I think the basketball there is really good. It's a basketball state. They love basketball. It might not produce. Uh, you know, read Shepherds every year, but those three teams—I I think Western, Northern, and and Eastern—they they win a lot of games. They're really good basketball teams at the mid-major level, and they're mostly homegrown teams. Um, so I, I think Kentucky basketball is 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 pretty good, to be honest with you. It is a stereotype of Kentucky players is that they'll go away for college and always end up back home, right? <laughs> so they don't travel well, yeah. but. You know, that's I don't know true. If that's true. That's true, though. I mean, that DC guys are the same way. A lot of those guys left. Our whole philosophy at GW was we looked at the DC players that would go away and we would say, Oh, these guys are going to come back. And so we wanted to keep roster spots open every year to allow those guys to come back and be closer to home. You know, what funny story about Kentucky? And I don't know if you remember this, but the year after I stopped coaching at Gonzaga, they needed a team for their tournament. And I said, Well, I got a pretty good Kentucky team I can bring in from Lexington. Like my old high school teammate coaches it, they got a top 150 player. They said, yeah, bring them in, but we're going to beat them, right? I go, you should, you're Gonzaga, but like they're going to throw four presses at you and do it all game. <laughs> and I'll be damned, that Kentucky team came in and beat Gonzaga the first game of their home tournament. And Steve was furious with me, but I said, I, I warned you, like, that's not a patsy you're getting yeah. in here. They and know uh, how to play, they move the ball, they, they have a good understanding. Like, it's good basketball. It's the IQ, Jamie. And, and you know, when prep athletics kind of started before it was actually prep athletics, I sent eight kids from Kentucky to do post-grad years and seven ended up going D one. Yeah. And it's not cause they weren't talented. It's just a basketball desert where a lot of schools would just not get there to see them. Right. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, being out in Colorado now too, there's a lot of talent out here. Just no one's seeing them except for yeah. the few regional schools around. So um, yeah, just interesting philosophies. Let me ask you this. What are your thoughts on players out of prep school versus players out of a normal high school? I actually think, uh, you know, I was involved in some coaching opportunities this off season, and I thought the prep school market is really strong. And like everyone right now is spending so much time on the portal. Um, I, I've never wanted to look where everyone else was looking. Um, and I look, I go, wow, these prep school kids can really play. 
they're a year older. Um, it, I mean, there's a lot of benefits to the prep school kids. And I thought the prep school kids, when I went up and watched a bunch this, this summer, I mean, this winter, I said, these guys can really play. They're going to help somebody. And when I'm talking to coaches right now, I'm on the phone saying, you should look at this prep school and take this guy. You look at the high school senior and take this guy. Um, because there's a market in the portal. Everyone feels more comfortable looking there. You have more information. Um, but just because you have more information or just because this guy scored, you know, 12 a game at, at some low major school that won four games, it doesn't mean that he can score 12 a game for you trying to win 22 games in a higher league. And it just doesn't correlate that way. And so, again, I think it's all about going back and trusting your eyes and looking at what works for you and what, what you believe in. Um, so I like the prep school guys. And I feel like it's really a market that's growing right now. You know, had I had I made a decision to be back in right now, I, I my plan was to take at least two prep school guys and take two high school guys. Um, and just start that way. And then look a, a year from now, they could leave in the spring. That could happen. That can happen anywhere, but go and get the best players you can get right now. They're going to buy into what you're asking them to do. They have a great hunger to win and to achieve and then figure that stuff out later. Yeah. But I'm talking specifically, Jamie, and like a high school player versus a post a prep school player. Like is the prep school player going to be more prepared when he gets to a campus or what have you seen? It in depends. Your experience? Uh, you know, like okay. I would say like, I think it depends on, again, that's why I'm like watching it more. Um, I just watch it more closely um, it depends. Like some of these prep schools, absolutely. Uh, you know, some of these prep schools, they're going to definitely be more ready. Um, but then there's some prep schools where they won't be, you know, there's some high school situations like you talk about like Steven Gonzaga, like, I mean, those guys can be ready to play. I mm -hmm. mean, how many of those guys have gone in and played as freshmen, and, you know, WCAC guys be ready to play. They have that Nike league. Now those guys will usually be ready to play. Um, so, you know, I think it's just all a case by case situation. Um, and depending on who they're playing for and, 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 uh, and, and really the level of accountability from the head coach. Um, I do think on, in a general sense, it's fair to say that a prep school coach is holding his guys more accountable. Guys are a little bit older. They're around a little bit more. They're, they're they've got one year commitment. So everyone's locked into to completing it in one year or sometimes a high school situation, guys are kind of moving around all the time and kind of puts can put the high school coach in a tough situation. But um, I think it's a case by case situation. I don't know if I could put an absolute on that. Okay. Yeah. There's no absolutes on that at all. Everyone's different, but looking for generalities. Now I want to find out, and this is for educational purposes for kids, right? Yeah. Everyone's played D one and you went from Mount St. Mary's to Siena to George Washington. Yeah. Kind of explain to me the glaring differences between the player you'd recruit at Mount St. Mary's versus in, you know, an A 10 kid at George Washington. Like those are different yeah. levels. And I'm talking guard specifically, okay. you know, because there's so many guards, guards out there. Yeah, I'll start with guards. Um, and I can go through all the positions, really. Like guards, we would do this thing where we go into every every time we got took a new job, we would look at the average height, average height uh, of of the starting fives, average heights of the all conference players. Um, right, because I think there's just a good way to know, uh, like what's the base on in this league for a good player size wise. Doesn't mean you can't take a smaller guy. But if you take a smaller guy who's five five and the average height in that league is six foot four, that that five foot five guy better be pretty dynamic mm -hmm. because he's going to be going against a nine inch, uh, eleven inch difference every every single night, right? So, um, and so I would say like number one at Mount St. Mary's and in the NEC or the MAC, you could take a little bit smaller guard. Um, the guards didn't have to be six foot three, six foot four. The A ten when you really look at it, it's kind of the 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 point where the guards kind of start to jump in terms of size. Um, you know, average NBA guard, I think is six foot five, just to use like a point of reference, of like how big the NBA guys are. Um, a lot of guys from the ACC, big 12, pack 10 and the big, in the big 10 back pack 12 and the big 10, they're like, they're going to be close to those sizes. Right. So, you know, when you're at that lower level, I might be able to take a smaller guy, but I'd recognize that when we go play the non-conference games and we're playing some of these games or top 25, our deficiency is going to be our size. Um, and just recognizing that, especially with the guards, but you know, one of the reasons you see these upsets in the NCAA tournament is, you know, these mid-major guards and the difference between, again, the difference between guards is so small. Like you might have a six foot three guard going for the six one guard, and my guard at six one might have more skill. Mm -hmm. You know, the six three guard for the high major might just be a super athlete. You know, who's never had to go pull back dribble, uh, pull back dribble crossover and get to the front of the rim. Where now my guys had to go pull back dribble crossover and he's beating that athlete over and over and over again just because there's, there, there's differences in how you have to play the game and how you learn the game. Um, so I, I would say that. And I think experience matters some as guys get a little bit older in their careers and just know a little bit more what to do and where not to go. Um, so when I look at guards, I, I start really there. That size of things is important. Um, the length. You know, I remember this time we are playing NC State. I was at Mount St. Mary's as a player. And we we're playing three guards. This is before three guards were fashionable. And I'm a six foot two, 
playing the three as a, as a third guard. And I remember ripping baseline against NC State, and I beat my first guy off the dribble. He's about six foot seven, and right below me was waiting for me was a six foot eleven big guy, you know. And I was like, man, like I struggled in those games because I just wasn't big enough. I was I was as athletic as the guy guarding me. Um, I could beat him off the dribble. I was probably faster than him. Maybe jumped higher. Maybe had a higher vertical, but he was just four inches taller. Right. Right. And so I think those kind of heights make a big difference. Those lengths make a big difference. Did you take later on in your career or even early in career? Did you look at wingspan? Was that is that an important Wingspan's factor for you? Everything. Um, really? Okay. You no. Know, what you get is you get guys with like long necks and big heads, and they make them seem like they're taller. <laughs> right. Um, they're not that tall. Like they just have a big head and a long neck. Um, so the wingspan is more true to what's valuable, right? No one blocks a shot with their head or, um, or and no one does any of those things. So the wingspan and your standing reach and how far you reach out, that's really important. You're, you know, we did a lot of metric testing. Um, so I'm like a big believer in some of this metric testing. Um, so, you know, your ability to jump straight vertically, your one step vertical, those things to me became really important because if you have good size and length and you can one step vertical and get off the floor quickly, you think about one step vertical means if I'm if I'm on the block defensively and the guy drives the opposite side of me, I can take one step and go meet that ball at the top of the square. Mm-hmm. Right, that's really valuable information to know. A guy is he long enough to do that? Is he quick enough to do that? So uh, you know, I start there with some of the measurables. The wingspan super important. We would always get guards, um, and I did feel like this was a major advantage for us at most places besides GW. When I got to GW, we just we weren't able to get some of this stuff done uh, recruiting wise. We wanted to in terms of the size. Um, but we still had some really good players. I think James Bishop was top 10 in the nation this year in scoring. Joe Bamsell was top top five in the league in scoring. So we've kind of found a way around it, but it wasn't what I was used to. Um, but we would always like Junior Robinson was five foot five, but he had a reach of six foot three. Right. So so his reach was 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 way more important than his size. And we would do that for every position. We had Don Carey at, at, at played for us. He was six foot five. He actually finished his career at Maryland, six foot five, but he had a reach of six foot nine. Mm. So our backcourt, we had a six foot five and a six foot nine reach in the backcourt. Um, and so we, we, you know, we, every year we basically lead our team and lead our league in steals because we block shots from behind or get steals um, from guys who had a little bit tighter reach. So we talked about what the differences were at the levels, but I'm going to ask you a, a question here. I ask every coach I talk to because it's, there's so much, it's, it's the most players out there are guards. What does it take for a guard to be a D1 guard? Well, Coach Phelan, the guy I played for who won over 820 plus games, 840 plus games, he said, you got to be able to make the 15 footer, number one. Um, you know, for me, I want guys that can always make shots that can, like, it's really hard to play someone if if they can't shoot the ball, mm. if they can't find a way to, to score the ball consistently. And shooting is the best way to score consistently. So, you know, we've had a lot of good guards. One of the reasons I think we've had, I think I did the number the other day. We have 20, we've had 22 players in the last 12 years that scored a thousand plus points or something. Um, and, and it's because I love guys that can score the ball. All right. Mm-hmm. So for me, it starts there. You know, can you like the reason junior Robinson at five, five could play in the NBA summer league wasn't just because he was super quick. It's because he could shoot the ball from well beyond the NBA three point range, which makes him quicker because right. now, because he'll shoot with that range, you have to go out there to guard him, which gives him more space to attack which gives him longer time to make a read and a decision, you know, where if he's five, you know, if he's five, five and can't make that, make the outside shot, you can really pack it in. And now your size is an advantage inside the lane. So shooting becomes really important. I think decision-making people underestimate decision-making. Can you, can you enter the pass on offense? Number one, and not turn the ball over. Can you get in the lane and deliver the ball to the right person at the right time with the right kind of temperament on the ball? Right. If it's a big and and he's stepping in, am I going to fire it at him or can I drop a little bounce pass, a toss it a lob where he can catch it and go do something with it? If it's a guy who loves me to pass it to him hard and a kick out, can I deliver it, you know, with the laces and deliver it right to his hands? If it's a guy who needs a little bit of time, can I deliver it a little bit of softness? Those kind of decision making on offense, you know, when to just catch it and go one more and when to catch it and ball fake and, and attack or when to when to drive. The decision making, basketball is the greatest game in the world. Because everybody on the floor has to make millions of decisions in the course of the game. We're just talking about offensive decision making. We're not even talking about defensive decision making. You know, middle of the floor, am I forcing this guy to his weak hand to his strong hand? Am I chasing him a certain way to make him go back to the middle? Or am I chasing him to make him have to push the ball out to the other side? 
those kind of small decision making things, you know, can I get on the, you know, baseline drive, can I sink into the inside of the big? And if I can't get the rebound, keep the big from being able to get it. Can I draw a foul in a situation where I'm at a disadvantage? Marcus Smart, like, can I draw a foul in a situation where I'm at a disadvantage because I make my the player across me have to do something more more exact more um, louder so that the referee can see it. Those are the things that I'm looking at. Like, I want guys that are great decision makers. And then if I wanted to give a third, I want guys that can elevate a room. Mm. I think personality is important. Um, you know, Kawhi Leonard, I watched him play last night. He's an amazing player. Uh, amazing. I mean, who wouldn't want to coach a guy like Kawhi Leonard? But those are so rare. Guys that can sort of play at such a high level and stay within themselves. And Those are rare, rare players. The majority of the great players that we know walk in a room and they elevate their room. They they find ways in the course of the game to inspire. You're down, you, the team's on an 18-0 run. You come down, you bang a three. You move the ball around, you get a layup, you get an and one, and you settle the tide. The best players need a little, but they make it a lot. So I'm always trying to find guys that have the ability to do that. Yeah, love that. Thanks for sharing that, Jamie. I think that's valuable for these young kids to hear, you know, for their development on trying to reach that level. Right. And I, 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 the last thing I would say is I love a good competitor. Mm -hmm. You give me a guy who's like a good, you know, it's rare that you see a guy now that you're like, man, this guy just competes. It's a 8 a.m. game. He's just competing. It's a 10 p.m. name. He's just competing. He's playing against the best team. The worst team He's just competing. Give me a guy who loves to compete that, you know, we're playing a three on three throwaway tournament on Saturday and he's trying to win every single time down the floor. Um, I think that's underappreciated because those who compete always win and they always kind of overcome a lot of adversity. And those who are sort of waiting for the opportunity to come to them, it never seems to get there. But the competitors find a way to get it and, and, and continue to make more of it. What you just mentioned makes me think of Javon Carter. Remember that story? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't believe that Hugs was there at 8 a.m. because I've been at those tournaments. Um, but <laughs> I believe that's a good Javon urban Carter, legend, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that's a little bit of a legend, but but maybe he made it up for one. Um, but uh, I definitely the hugs type of guy. And you know, when you look, I think I, I, I think I read the other day, like West Virginia is one of the few teams in, in the history that not have a five star star five star player. You know, West Virginia basketball is sort of built on guys like Javon Carter, guys yeah. who are under the radar that are going to take everything they get that just flat out compete. And that's why Bob Huggins is a great coach for, for West Virginia because he's going to acquire that anyone that comes there and plays. Yeah, and those kids got a chip on their shoulder because some of them feel like they should have those star rankings. And I'm yeah. sure he fuels that fire every day in practice oh, too. Oh, man. So. I'm, I, I can imagine him just 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 stoking that fire daily with the treadmill, with the treadmill runs. <laughs> so, um, But just I mean, an amazing, amazing coach. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me ask you about this. It seems like – more so than ever, you just see bad decisions being made, whether it's kids transferring high schools, whether it's transferring AU teams, whether it's putting their name in the transfer portal, declaring early for the draft. And what do you think gives the basketball world – why do you think there's such bad advice floating around the basketball world? Well, there's a couple things. Number one, people struggle with options. Options without consequences are dangerous. Options without direct consequences are dangerous, right? So, hey, I'm going to go in the draft. Oh, it's a great idea. Let's go and do that. Well, you're not going to get you're 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 not going to get drafted. So it's like directly, I feel good. Oh, it's great. The indirect consequence is later on when I'm fighting for a two way or I'm having to go overseas. But I could have played one more year and been a late first round pick. Um, so I think that's always a danger. Um, it's just like knowing what options you really have and what options you really don't have. Um, you know, you've been through this recruiting, I'm sure, many times. You know, a kid has 10 schools. So what's important to you? He'll say, well, academics is one and uh, closest to home. And all right, so let's look at the 10. You have two schools where those are the most important thing. So you really don't have 10 options. You have two options, mm -hmm. right? So the, the ability to look at what you really have and what you really don't. Um, I think we, in general, we struggle with that um, because basketball – because it's such a player dominated league, which is amazing is really so much about creating leverage and creating leverage provides you opportunities where you can say, I'm basically a free agent. I want to go and play here. I want to play with these people. So people are oftentimes trying to move around to create leverage opportunities to get exactly what they want. 
not realizing that most time in life, you don't get exactly what you want. And, and so that ability to say, I'm going to go provides easy leverage. Now I would encourage people to say, instead of looking for easy leverage to have real conducted, real, real, real deep conversation with your leadership and the people around you and the people that have information and go into whatever conversation is with such an open mind that you allow the evidence to speak to what you should do. You know, it's a game where everyone's dreaming. My dreams would be here. Your dreams would be there. But there's a business side of it and a reality side of it. You know, like the game doesn't love you and the game doesn't love your dream. The game sort of operates from those who find a way to make the most of the opportunities with, with what's in front of them. So I think those situations in terms of having options without direct, you know, direct consequences and the need to always feel like you need to create leverage. I mean, every off season, we've got NBA guys going, I want to leave. We're like, this guy just signed a contract last year. That's basketball culture where it stands today. Mm -hmm. um, and people will say that's some of the coaching culture that it stands today. Um, all of that speaks to the volatility of the basketball market. We can be here today and we can be, be gone tomorrow. We can be traded tomorrow. We can be fired tomorrow. We can be, that just speaks to the volatility of the entire market. And that's how people that are inside that market are learning how to operate. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you see kids all the time and you're like, why did they make that decision? Probably to make it on their own. There's probably someone in the background as well saying, you know, planting that seed with them or telling them they're not getting theirs or whatever. And I just, it, it, you see all the time and, and it doesn't work out great. It's like I've had players that have gone to the portal. It, it, they've, they've upgraded. I've had players that go in the portal and they're out of the game two months later, right. I, but that's know, life. Welcome to life too. It's yeah. a great lesson. I would always do this, Corey. I don't, I don't know if many coaches did this, but I would always do this. You know, we'd have a guy come in and say, Hey coach, I want to transfer. And if it was a guy that I knew could get some good traction and get some good stuff, I would say, even if it wasn't good for me, the guy was going to get some good traction. I'm like, Hey, well, tell me what you're looking for. Hey, I want this and this. If it was a pretty in line of what they were going to get on the market, I'd say, you know what? I'd love to have you. You know, you, you try to keep the guy, obviously, but I understand. But the majority of the time, you know, 10% of the time, he'd be a guy that was going to go on the market and get what he wanted. 90% of the time, it was a guy that would come in and say, coach, I want to go here, here, and here. I said, well, wait a minute. You know, you averaged four points a game here for us. I actually think you got a good future here. I think, I would tell a guy, I think a year from now, that's probably more realistic. Because you're going to get more opportunity this year. You're going to be a little bit bigger, bigger, stronger. I was like, but let's let's do this. Tell me where you want to go, and I'll call every one of those head coaches. And if they say they want to take you, I'll, I'll, I'll say go to the portal. I said, but if they don't, because I would say, you, you know, you're not coming back here. Oh, wow. <laughs> right? Once okay. you go in the portal, you're, you're not coming back here. You know, we're, you know, we're, we're going to recruit heavy and we're, because now we also know who you are. So yeah. It's like, you know, yeah. I, I can go and find, find someone else. Maybe does a little bit, does a little bit things differently. But I would say, let, let me make those calls. And about half the time, the kids take me up on it. Yeah, please call. Let me know. Oh, I got you. I'll call and I'll say, hey, this, this school really likes you. I think you should do that. Um, I'd call and then say, God, I think you're going to be in that portal for a little bit. I don't think you should do this right now. I think you should probably think this through and see if you need to work this out. Sometimes they would take me up on that. Most of the time they wouldn't. But I always feel like that was a good service to try to provide to the players. Like, you know, just I know the market better than you do. And you have two points a game and you started 18 games. I, that's not going to strike a lot of people saying we got to have you on their team. So maybe give it another year, recommit yourself here. We'll figure it out. Um, it was always a productive conversation to say the least. And I think our, I do. We'll say this Corey. I think our players did appreciate, I think my, my players did appreciate the willingness to have the conversation and to not just uh, kick them out of the office or, you know, do whatever. I think let's just have a conversation and see what works for you and see what works for us. Yeah. That's a mature thing, which I don't know if every program does that, Jamie. And so it's good to hear you did that. Um, we're going to role play now. You're going to be the king of the NCAA. <laughs> you get, so how do you handle the transfer portal situation that so many people are loving and so many people are hating right now? How do you upgrade it or change it? You know, I, for graduation purposes, you know, what people don't know, baseball had this rule where you didn't have to sit out before and kids just weren't graduating. Because the kids were kind of moving around, 
and they weren't graduating. And, and so that's when all this APR stuff kind of started coming back into play. APR was created to increase graduation rates around colleges, to make, to incentivize colleges, uh, graduating their students. And it worked. The APR worked. We were coming out of a, I think I want to say it's like last 15 years is the highest rate of graduation for men's basketball and women's basketball in the history of the game. It worked. What I struggle with is if you have the data that says something doesn't work, then why would you, why would you then just to appease everyone? And, and here's some of the issue to my understanding, here's some of the issue in these other sports, you could transfer right away and play right away. Right. And tennis and golf and these other sports, but in basketball and football, you couldn't. So in the need to make everyone have the same rule, they said, well, everyone should be able to transfer right away and not be, not, not be able to. Now, here's what I think is, here's, here's what I think should have been done. So I'm king is what I'm doing. Yep. If you're on 51% aid from the, from the university, okay, you get, if you go somewhere else, you got to sit, right? Men's basketball, football, you're on hundred percent aid. Now, I, and we can make them play with the numbers. It could be 75, whatever. But that's now telling the player that they're really committed to you. Maybe 75 is a better number, right? 75%. Because I also think it's hard if you're a tennis if you're a tennis athlete and you're paying to go to school to say, well, you got to go out somewhere and sit. If you can pay less to go somewhere else, right? <clears throat> but if someone's on seventy five percent aid, eighty percent aid, whatever number that's settled on, you, you, that school's made a pretty sizable commitment to you to be there. And I think if you're over a certain aid amount, then you should have to sit. Right now, now what? Now this also gives the player power. Hey, I don't want to be on 75% aid. I want to be on 73% aid. Because this doesn't work out, I want to have the ability to transfer out. It gives you power at the beginning of the negotiation process um, to kind of let everybody know where we stand. You also know if they come back and say, hey, I can only offer you 55% aid where you are. Yeah, and then that coach could come back and say, we're going to 55% as a freshman. We're going to give you 80 as a as a as a junior to make up for it. All right, now we've got a relationship that we're working on. We can put that in writing. We're going to be a good place to go. Um, so to me, I, I think the sit-out is good. I think the sit-out, we know statistically it's going to make, allow people to graduate more. I care about graduation because everybody's not playing in NBA. Everyone's not playing right. in the G League. And everyone's not going to be a professional tennis player or golfer. So the graduation to me matters. I think that's important. Um, you know, And so in turn, what they're trying to do to try to work, take care of the graduations are like, now they're allowing colleges to pay for graduation for 10 years after someone finishes, which just takes a chance on someone not finishing. Right. If I know if you sit, you're going to finish, then let's take care of this while we're all here um, and give ourselves opportunities. So I would, I would adjust that if I was king for the day, that's, that's how I would look at it. I'd try to figure out a way to add a percentage to the aid that you're receiving to, to how long to, how, to, if you have to sit out or not. Right now, a basketball guy can come in and say, "Well, I want to be on seventy three percent aid. I'm going to pay this. I got nil money. I want to pay this other side. All right, but at least we all know where we are." Yeah. The hard part right now is that for no one, teams, players, coaches, administration, you don't know who's going to be on your team because there is no contract for anyone. Right, and so people come back and they say, "Well, like, well, coaches can leave whenever they want." Well, you got to pay his buyout. <laughs> so someone has to pay that buyout. You know, like that's a that's a that's a deterrent. You know, some people say, you know, I've been on job university for coach. We're not paying any buyouts. Well, I'm out of that job opportunity, mm-hmm. right? And I just think when you don't have any kind of deterrent, it's gonna be kind of chaotic. Uh, I mean, if you could have a if you bought a Jeep last year, and you drove it around for a year, and then next year they're like, hey, we're gonna give you a brand new Jeep, Corey, a brand new Jeep. Now uh, you got the you got the 22. We're gonna give you the 23. All right. Would you say, no, I'm going to stay with what I got. I, I just, no, we got a couple upgrades. You know, you, you've got zero miles on it. Like you're going to take the new Jeep every single time. Yeah. Everybody is. Um, and, and so I don't think what we're seeing in the portal is a, again, I don't think it's a criticism. I think this is a reality of how we would all operate if there were no consequences to moving around and that the consequences down the road of, well, you might not be able to graduate are so far down the road that people don't don't look at that as a as a major consequence. And they're saying, well, I can come back and get it. Do you know how hard it is to come back and get your degree after you after you've gone into the world, made some money, and now you have to like that's a really hard task to do. Um, 
I think in some ways we're being irresponsible because I think if we just had a sit out, I think it allow it, it, it a sit out in the right way gives us every gives everybody everything they want. Um, in a lot of ways. And I just think we we kind of passed the buck on it. You're in these coaching circles and NCA circles. What are you hearing in the tea leaves or seeing in the tea leaves that might be happening? Well, they're just telling everybody, this is the new age. This is how it's going to be. This is how you have to adjust. Don't complain about it. Okay. Um, and, and, I, and I think for the most part, I think coaches and I, I think coaches are going to adapt faster than fan bases and administrations. Right. I mean, I've been on the, every one of these interviews, are like, you know, talking to me, are saying, well, coach, you know, I just, you know, how can we keep these guys here? And I'm thinking like, well, are you paying them? Are you paying them? Like, like it's a financial decision now. Um, and so therefore, you know, you have to understand what like baseline rewards are. Baseline rewards essentially just says um, you've got to meet certain criteria that's good enough. You know, right? Like if I'm paying someone $30,000 a year, well, they might not take the job to t- making forty because they're going to say, well, I'm comfortable here. I like my job here. I like what I'm doing here. I'll just stay at the 30 and I'll, I'll eat that 10 grand and, and I'll, I'll have that 10 grand in happiness knowing what I get. But you can't ask someone who's making 30 to not make 100. Yeah, you know now that baseline rewards needs to move up closer to that hundred, um, just for them to be able to do that. So I think coaches will adjust faster. I think administration understanding what their job is and what it looks like now will be will be lagging behind some, because the world's just different. You know, you look at these academic schools. I mean, this year, Bucknell was was Bucknell was usually pretty good at basketball. I remember when, when growing up, Cal was good at basketball, and Jason got in. Jason Kidd played there; was amazing. Um, Rice was 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 about where they've been at. Um, Stanford had a tough year. Uh, you know, you just start kind of going through them all. You know, Vanderbilt was a little bit better this year. Northwestern was a little bit better this year. Davidson was down. There's a reason why these academic schools are struggling so much. It's not because they're not they don't have the best educations in the world because they do. It's because it's harder for them to replace their best players than it is anyone else. Mm-hmm. And it's also because those places are so so strong academically, which is a positive. That's not a negative they're going to be slower to adjust to to what's best for student athletes because the reason that they're one of the best in the world is that they've done what's best for students period um and so i think it's just hard for people to sort of like understand that it there's some lag time behind some of these systems in place so it's just going to take a little bit of time for people to kind of catch up gotcha last thing and then we'll get into the quick hitters here is there an nil um uh, is there a college program out there that's utilizing the NILs better than any other that you've seen? You know, from what I'm hearing, Arkansas, Houston, Texas, a lot of down south, Alabama, you know, Miami, obviously, um, mm-hmm. they're they're hitting it better better than anyone. Um, their you know, their networks are dialed in. They're passionate about it. They're using it as a way to move their programs forward. They understand what they need. They understand what the kids are looking for. Um, I, w- I would start there. Um, I'm sure there are some others, but those are ones that jump off the top of my top of my head. Gotcha. All right, Jamie, we're going to finish up here with some quick hitters. All right. Sure. Best player you guarded in college. TJ Ford. Mm-hmm. Best win you had as a player in college. Uh, we beat Duquesne in a bye game. The Mount St. Mary's in its history has only has four or five bye wins. We beat Duquesne. I had 24 points and like seven or six or seven rebounds or something. That was a great, great individual game and, and uh, stepped up for my team that day. Cool. Best win you ever had as a coach? Mm. That's a really tough question. I got a lot of wins about right around my head. We beat Bob McKillop at Davidson when I was at GW in a mm. triple overtime game. Uh, I will always remember that as it's a great game. I mean, he's a Hall of Fame head coach. I'm now a, a coach on sabbatical. Um, so those are big moments to be able to go against one of the very best, a guy who you just have enormous respect for as a coach, as a tactician, and to have our team show up and beat them uh, and, and and to grind it out in three overtimes. Uh, definitely, definitely probably one of the bigger wins I've had. Jumping on that, did you ever hear what Coach K is? favorite win of all time was what army he's at army uh, yeah army the seventh he won the seventh 
seventh place in some tournament in the seventh, eighth place game. <laughs> and it was like his first big win as a college coach. And he said, I, I know I've won all these titles and Olympic gold medals, but like that was the biggest win of my life at, you know, and it kind of always stuck with me. So I've always yeah. thought that was kind of neat. There's definitely some wins that happen where you feel like that it's like a changing of the momentum. Yeah. Who's the best player you've ever coached against who just let you guys up? Well, Obi Toppin's entire draft, um, his entire draft uh, <laughs> highlights were on our team. So I would say Obi Toppin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What are your hobbies when you're not doing something with basketball? I love TV. I actually thought about starting like a TV uh, vlog because I just love TV. Um, up on all, all the, watching a ton of different shows all the time. And Coach Fellinoy said you had to have something different. He was a big golfer. Um, I like watching TV with my wife and, and talking about talking about different TV shows. Okay. Last thing, favorite movie of all time. Oh, got a few of them that go on rotation. Give me a few then. Yeah, just doesn't have to be one. Major League. I love oh. Major League. Um, the perfect game. Well, maybe that's not the right title. Um, with Kevin Costner, um, where he has the perfect game and he and it it's just like all comes together. Um, I see the title of it. I just can't remember the name of it, but um, I love that. I like watch those all the time. Um, I watch those on game days. Actually, <laughs> I'm a big rom com guy on game days. Um, so, so sort of start with those. I love Forrest Gump. I just love the historical content of it, even though it's not real. Um, so I love watching, watching that, um, training day, uh, mm -hmm. just love Denzel and training day. But I mean, I've got, a, I've got a few that I kind of watch on, on regular, um, on a regular basis. Like for some reason, like, like, uh, fast and furious. I feel like I can watch every time, every day, no matter what, um, simple, to, simple to understand, simple to process and, and enjoyable to watch. Awesome. Well, Jamie, where can people find you? I'm a lot of places. Uh, my name is unique. Jamian, J A M I O N Christian. You can find me on Twitter there where I'm very active on Twitter, very active on Instagram as well. Um, and you also find me on LinkedIn, uh, a little bit of TikTok, trying to figure that part out, but you know, I'm pretty easy to find. You put my name in there. Uh, I think there's only, there's only one or two Jamians that could even pop up and, and my, uh, SEO is usually up there, up there pretty high. Yeah, the old good old SEO. <laughs> well, Jamie and my friend, it's uh, it's good to have you on the podcast. Talk to you in this formal setting. Um, I, I appreciate our friendship from from way back. It's been fun to follow your career and and uh, you know share it with you throughout these years. And uh, thanks so much for coming on board today. No, I appreciate it. I, and before we go, I do want to say um, I, I just appreciate you so much. Y y your passion for people and your passion for players. And helping them on the next level, the next step, it's really rare to find that in this business. Um, I just love how genuine you do it. You do it in such a caring way and a compassionate way for for others. Um, I enjoy our friendship, but I've enjoyed watching you have a ton of success, and you've got so many great things out of you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. If you guys enjoyed this episode, you can hit all of our episodes on all the major podcasting platforms. We're also on YouTube as well. If you want to watch this versus listening to it. And if you have any questions on prep school, feel free to reach out to me. The website's prepathletics.com. We've got great content on there. All the podcasts are on there. And uh, stay tuned for our next uh, great interview in the upcoming weeks. So Jamie and Christian, thanks so much for joining me. We'll see you guys again next time. Take care.